Hello and welcome back to Equip. We've transitioned from helping you build a foundation to now preparing you to launch off of our aircraft carrier. Last time we introduced the concept of calling. We said general calling applies to all believers, to all of us. We're all called to glorify God and make disciples. But personal calling is the unique way that you do those things. And remember we used Apollo 11 as an example. We said everyone involved in Apollo 11 had the same mission, to get men on the moon. But everyone, including Jack Garman, had a unique role to play in that mission. And in the same way, all believers in Jesus have the same overall mission, which is the Great Commission. But what is your unique role within that Great Commission? In this session, we're going to start answering that. And let me start with where we're going. There was a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. His name was Howard Hendricks. He taught for over 60 years and had an estimated 10,000 plus students during his career, including some very high profile pastors and scholars. And whenever he would get a new batch of students, he would start by drawing a diagram on the board. It would look something like this. He would say the top part of this funnel represents everything that you can do for God. There are many things you can do. And guess what? The more success you have, the more opportunities will come up. But then Professor Hendricks would say, my greatest fear for you isn't failure, but success at the wrong thing. Most opportunities are a distraction in disguise. In other words, don't let good things distract you from what's best. Don't let nice activities distract you from doing what God designed you to do. And so he would say, find the one thing that you must do for God and give your life to that. That's what we want to help you start doing today. We want to help you find the one thing that you must do for God, for the Great Commission. To help you do that, we're going to use a tool that we call your two words. Your two words are a simple and memorable way of naming your personal calling, your unique role in God's kingdom. Here's how it works. Your two words complete this sentence. I exist to glorify God and make disciples by, and then you have your two words. Now this is important. Our two words all complete the same sentence. Why? Because we all have the same general calling. We're all called to glorify God and make disciples. But your two words Describe the unique way that you do that, your personal calling. So for example, my two words are unearthing wonders. I exist to glorify God and make disciples by unearthing wonders. In other words, my personal calling is to unearth awe-inspiring wonders in God's word and his world, his creation. I live to help people be amazed and stunned by God, by his glory in scripture and in creation. That's my unique role within our greater mission. And you can see some other examples of two words in your notes. We'll go over those more in the weeks ahead. But why only two words? Well, the power of two words is that it's easy to remember. It's easy to keep in your mind at all times. Have you ever seen, or, or maybe you've even been part of an organization that had a mission statement that was paragraphs long? Even if every word in that mission statement is good, guess what? Nobody remembers it. And if you can't remember it, you're not going to live by it. But everyone can remember two words, which will help you live by them. Now, keep in mind, this is just a tool to help you understand your calling. This isn't the be all end all. And your understanding of your calling will likely change over time. But we want to help you to the best of your ability. Given your current knowledge, name your role in God's kingdom. Now, the key to understanding your two words is to know that the first word is usually related to your God-given abilities, and the second word is usually related to your God-given passions. Remember last time we said that you're designed to make a distinct difference. God designed you as his poema, his masterpiece, his artwork. He designed you with unique abilities and passions for specific good works. 
which he prepared in advance for you to do. So knowing your God-given abilities and passions will help you understand what you're designed to do. With that, in this session, we're going to focus on your God-given abilities. And I want to start by looking at a couple passages of scripture to lay a foundation for us. The first one is Exodus 31. And for context, by this point, God has led Israel out of Egypt and they've entered a covenant with God. Part of that covenant was making a place for sacrifices and for God's presence to dwell. That place was called the tabernacle. It was basically a portable temple. And God gave Israel very specific instructions for how to make the tabernacle. It involves skilled labor, including things like making materials out of thread and metal and wood. And so the question is, how will Israel make everything that God commanded them to? Well, here's what God says. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses. Look, I have appointed by name Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with God's spirit, with wisdom, understanding, and ability in every craft. I have also selected Ohaliab, son of Ahizamech, of the tribe of Dan, to be with him. I have put wisdom in the heart of every skilled artisan in order to make all that I have commanded you. Now, I want us to notice a few things here. First of all, God chose individuals for specific tasks. He named certain people. He said, I have appointed Bezalel and Ohaliab. And he equipped those people he chose with specific abilities. He said he filled them with his spirit and gave them wisdom and ability to complete the tasks that he had given Israel. In other words, God equips the called. I also want us to see that while we tend to focus on public gifts, all of God's people are equipped to make a difference. When we think about Israel, who do we usually think about? Moses, right? And maybe Aaron. Moses for his leadership, Aaron for his speaking. We focus on people with public gifts. But this passage shows us that God used everyone. Because even beyond the people who are named in this passage, it says, I have put wisdom in the heart of every skilled artisan. We have a large group of unnamed people that God equips for his purposes. And as we step back and and look at the Old Testament, every tribe and every person had a role to play in the nation of Israel. And looking at the New Testament, we see something very similar. Paul talks about spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. He says, now there are different gifts, but the same spirit, a manifestation of the spirit is given to each person for the common good. To one is given a message of wisdom through the spirit, to another a message of knowledge by the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit. One in the same spirit is active in all these, distributing to each person as he wills. In other words, this passage says that every believer in Christ has one or more spiritual gifts. He said a manifestation of the spirit is given to each person, each believer for the common good. A spiritual gift, then, is any ability given by the Holy Spirit to build up the church. And every believer has at least one spiritual gift. Now, what's the difference between a spiritual gift and other abilities? Well, we can say that natural talents are inherited at birth, while spiritual gifts are received when we're born again. We only get spiritual gifts when we're saved through the Holy Spirit. Another thing to keep in mind is that only believers have spiritual gifts, but everyone has natural talents. And spiritual gifts are given specifically to build up the church, while natural talents can be used for selfish gain for any purpose. But here's the thing. While there's technically a difference between spiritual gifts and what we call natural talents, they're often hard to tell apart. There's often overlap. Our spiritual gifts may complement our natural talents. God may take a natural ability and empower it by his spirit. For example, we saw in Exodus 31 that God took skilled craftsmen and empowered them by his spirit. 
they were already skilled. They had natural talents, but then God empowered those abilities. He equipped them and gave them wisdom to complete the task that God had given them. So there's often overlap between natural talents and spiritual gifts. And ultimately, guess what? Both types of gifts are still from God. We tend to say natural talents, but they're still God-given. They're still part of his design for you. And they can still be used for his kingdom. So we're not going to distinguish between these different types of gifts as we move forward. I just want you to be aware that there technically is a difference. So the main idea I want us to see in 1 Corinthians 12 and Exodus 31 is that every believer is uniquely gifted for kingdom impact, whether that's through natural talents or spiritual gifts or both. Every person in Israel had a role to play. And Paul says that every believer in Jesus has been given gifts to build up the kingdom. God equips his people with abilities to accomplish his purposes. So understanding our abilities will help us understand what God wants us to do. People often wonder, how do I know what God wants me to do? Do you know what I often say? What are you good at? The things you're good at aren't an accident. You're God's handiwork. Your design is a clue to what you're supposed to do. So with that, we're now going to move into some exercises that will help you understand your abilities. A couple of disclaimers here. Yes, you're going to have homework, but keep in mind, what you put into this process is what you get out of it. Remember, the purpose of equip isn't to entertain you, but to equip you. You have to take ownership for this process to work. The other thing to keep in mind is that none of these exercises are perfect. That's part of why we have you do several exercises, not just one. But ultimately, the best way to learn about your abilities is by doing things, by trying different things. So your understanding of your abilities may change over time. But with all that being said, we can give you a good starting point. So the first exercise you're going to do is called Abilities 360. And I think this is the most important exercise. Outside of learning about our abilities by doing, the next best thing is to ask other people what they see in you. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to text or talk to up to five people who know you well. These should be people that you would go to for advice. So don't ask random people on the street, okay? You're going to ask up to five people that you trust to give you three words to describe your top abilities. And you can see there's some sample wording in your notes for how to text or talk to somebody about this. And you want them to try to give you only three words. Let me give you an example from when I did this exercise. Here are the responses that I got. I asked five people that each gave me three words. And you want to try to look for words or ideas that are repeated. So for example, almost all of my responses could be grouped into two categories. The first one was researching or learning. And then the second one was communicating, writing, speaking, teaching. So look for patterns here. And again, I think this exercise is very helpful because people often see things in us that we don't. Or they can give us confirmation. Sometimes we think we're good at something, but other people are like, "Eh, I'm not so sure. Or sometimes we think we're not good at something, but everyone else does. For example, I never thought I was good at public speaking. I hated it. I didn't want to do it. But through the counsel of other people, here I am. Godly counsel from other people is so valuable. So if you only do one exercise, make it this one. Now, there are a couple of other exercises I recommend that you do. One is a strengths test. This is a a free online assessment that will help you list your top strengths. There's also a spiritual gift assessment that you can do through your BAC profile. And for both of those assessments, there are instructions in your notes for how to access them. So take those assessments and, and don't overthink your responses, just go with your gut and then record your top five results for both of those tests in your notes. Then 
Your final step is to name your abilities. This is what all the other exercises are building toward. You're going to look at the results from your exercises and your goal is to summarize your abilities using one word. Now, it should be an action word or a verb for those of you who remember parts of speech. An action word ending in ing. Why? Because this is going to help you form the first part of your two words. And there are questions and prompts in your notes to walk you through this. But let me give you an example from when I did this. Here are the results from my exercises. So looking through this, I noticed two major themes being repeated. Researching and communicating. So then I tried to think through, how do I summarize both of those ideas in one word? Now there's a list of example words in your notes. Your word doesn't have to come from that list. Use it as a starting point. But for me, I chose the word unearthing. Why? Because it captures the idea of researching and digging and learning, but it also conveys the idea of revealing or communicating something. Unearthing also has the bonus of being related to my interests since I have a background in geology. Yes, I studied geology in college, but before you make fun of me, just remember even the rocks cry out. So feel free to be creative with the word that you choose here. But don't worry if you can't find the perfect word right now. We're going to have time to go back and wordsmith later. For now, just try to get the concept right. Spend time praying and thinking and try to summarize the heart behind your God-given abilities with one word. That's your ultimate goal. So before our next session, finish doing these exercises, pick your one word to describe your abilities, and come ready to discuss that word for the next session and you'll be one step closer to naming your personal calling. Remember, there are many things that you can do, but most things are a distraction in disguise. Find the one thing you must do. The one thing that you were made to do as part of God's mission. He designed you as his poema, his craftsmanship. You have a unique role to play in the Great Commission. So let's make our lives count and let's do it all for his glory.